Saturday. It's Scotland and it's 2 p.m. Not 1 p.m. It's 2 p.m. And we're back in original form. The legible, credible, inevitable storm, which is a force for good. Broadcasting to you live from our nerve center here in the great British city of Glasgow with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. And we're broadcasting a little bit later today. And something happening in Glasgow that some of you might be aware of. So we thought we would let that go ahead and we would come in just at the end at two o'clock. And of course, I'm speaking about the old firm football game, which is a big thing here in Glasgow. And it was got particularly mentioned this week because quite a few people were wanting to actually go out of Glasgow, go down to England and to watch it in pubs where you could actually get into a pub, which were open and which also sold alcohol. So that was big on the news this week. And I just want to talk about that briefly. We're also in this program, we're going to talk about the apparent rise of the, the, the separatists in the polls and what we can do about that. We're also going to talk about our ongoing Twitter suspension. And we've got some news on that for you. And we're going to look at a very good book about which has just been released about social media censorship. And of course, this coming week in British history. Rich, thanks. Wishing you a great British day and a great British weekend as well. And Helen says, keep up the good work. Thank you, Helen. We intend to do so. We intend to do so. And Wendy is watching from Hampshire. Good to see you on Wendy. Alan asks, how are we? We're doing well, Alan. Thank you very much. We're doing well. We are keeping the British end up as always here in Glasgow. It's something and just continuing to grow on all our social media platforms. More about that later in the program. Grant says STV bias has to be addressed. But how, well, how do we address the ongoing SNP TV bias? That's, uh, that's a difficult one. Ian says, do we believe the polls? No, we don't really believe the polls. We take cognizance of them. We, we, we look at them, we consider them, but we don't take them for um, the exact truth because polls, as we always say, are intended to lead opinion just as much as they are intended to reflect opinion. They're intended to make people think about things that they never thought before and make them accept things that they never thought before and lead them in certain directions, much more so really than actually trying to find whether or not it's a true reflection of reality. It is possible, though, that at the moment, the, the polls in Scotland are a bit of both, actually. Dottie is saying hello from County Tyrone. Love your work as I'm an Ulster Scot. Good for you, Dottie. Um, Graham says, good day for Glasgow. And William is behind us all the way. Well, yeah, quite a lot of people, I don't know how many people have ventured into England from Glasgow to watch the game, but I was astonished to read on the front of the Metro on Thursday. Don't come dancing. It was uh, Nicholas Sturgeon saying, basically, don't go to Blackpool. Imagine, imagine, imagine a national leader actually putting a black mark on another British town like that. That's, that's a terrible thing for any British leader to do, uh, especially when it's Blackpool, of course, which everybody loves. But actually trying to put like the mark of Cain on it or something like that. You can't you can't go to Blackpool. How outrageous. And then it even went on that she had hinted that she could follow Wales and close the border, the border so-called. Well, my understanding is that that is what has happened in Wales. 
that the jumped up first minister of the Welsh Assembly has closed the Welsh border. Now, you have to ask, how has that happened? How is that even allowed? If you have local panjandrums, to use the old fashioned word, who can actually close down the border of their area of the United Kingdom, then you don't have a United Kingdom. You don't have a United Kingdom. So I don't know what under what laws they claim that they can shut down the border. But how can Wales shut down the border? Is, does, that, does that mean that England will have to shut down the border with, with Wales? Or does it have to happen on both sides or does it just happen on one side? You can, you can get out of Wales, but you can't get into Wales. Is that what the situation is these days? If so, it's an absolute crying shame and a disgrace. And our British Parliament should not be standing for the carve up of the United Kingdom in that way, because that goes against everything that we believe in as unionists, which is that we have free travel from one end of our islands to the other, from east to west, from Lostoff Ness to Belik in County Fermanagh, the two widest points of our islands from and from from Shetland down to the Scilly Islands, we should have freedom of movement. And if we don't have freedom of movement, then something has gone seriously wrong in the so-called uh, devolution situation that, that we're in. May says hi from Fife, and Alan says greetings fellow islanders. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, good to see folk also on YouTube, Jonathan. Who gets to act, who gets to participate in these polls? Well, exactly. I've never been asked. So, if you if you are down in England watching the game, do give us a, do give us a, a mention. Uh, tell us where you are, and we'll wish you the very best. But just talking again about the power that our politicians seem to be having over our country at the moment. A lot of this was completely unexpected. Even seasoned political watchers such as ourselves never really understood the extent to which politicians have this power, if they want now, just to just to make the rules. And Neil Oliver put it very well, as he always does in talk radio this week, and we'll put the link up to that after we've finished the programme. We'll put it in the description box. But he said, and I quote, it's been like a very alarming wake up call. I hadn't really realized in my naivety that a government that just happened to be in power, which was holding the parcel when the music stopped, could then award itself all the powers that it wants to have whatever control it wants to have over every move that everyone makes every moment of the day. In my naivety, I hadn't actually modeled that, if you like, and thought that was even possible. That every time we put a tick in the ballot box, we were surrendering our every liberty and our every freedom to whoever was actually in authority in Holyrood or in Downing Street when something like this happened. If a government can just take it upon itself to do whatever it wants with our lives, well, that's been a real wake up call for me. Plainly, they do have that in their power to write that legislation, to get it through Parliament by whatever means. And here we are now where we just have to wake up every morning to be told basically whether we can go out of our houses or not. That was very well put by Neil Oliver on the 14th of October on Talk Radio. And you can see that link, which we'll put up after the broadcast. And that made us think about something that we've been puzzling about for a little while. Thomas watching from Malaysia. Good, Thomas. Good, good. I hope it's hope things are good for you out there. Something that we've been thinking about just um, really minded to it by a Simon Heffer article that we read in the Sunday Telegraph back in September. Are we losing what it means to be British? 
And what he was referring here to was one or two cultural elements and also one or two political elements that we've become we've got kind of concerned about at the moment. The political element being what Neil Oliver was just talking about there, the absence of accountability in Parliament, the absence of debate in Parliament over these huge, huge changes and huge controls that are being brought in. As well as talking about the elevation of the, sn the snitch culture as well, which tends not to be a British culture. The idea that you report people because you saw them sitting in a park or something like that, that's, a, that's fairly unusual and it's not a good development at all. And also the, the idea that uh, personal responsibility, of course, is very much, or well, used to be certainly very much a British theory, uh, a British concept, a British belief in personal responsibility. And to that, I would add other things. And I'm putting together an article on this, which will develop around the idea of British cultural conventions. Okay, these are things that uh, reflect our national character and have been found historically in song, in poetry, in story, and which we like to think are particular characteristics of the British. You know, and I, wanted, I want to make the difference between a characteristic and a value. When certain types talk about what it means to be British, they'll talk about values. But when you look at those values, those values are very often just universal values that everybody has. Being nice, being polite, things like that. Um, what we're talking about is characteristics, sort of uh, the things that model the actual human being, that create the human being's sense of their reality. And one of them was is bravery. Britons never, never shall be slaves. A, a British characteristic founded in song. Well, I would like to think that we will no longer be slaves, but sometimes it looks like when you look at the people outside going along with all the rules and regulations, it makes you wonder to what extent are we losing that British characteristic? Hopefully it can be reborn again. Another characteristic is uh, a Briton's home is his castle. That's been accepted for, for centuries. But now you're told that you can only have certain numbers of people in your home. Or you can't even have uh, somebody that you're very friendly with in your home. Uh, that that's completely going against the idea that a Britain's home is his castle. So is, I do hope that's not going to go with the wind. You know, when this COVID situation started, a good appeal, I think, was made to the best of, of our British characteristics, which is was that we were all in it together and that we would all pull together. And in fact, during the very early stages, the first two or three weeks, that's what we were doing. And most of us were quite happy or maybe not happy, but were quite willing to go along with that. And it gave us two or three weeks off work. And it was quite nice weather at the time. And we were getting paid and there wasn't any feeling that we were going to lose our jobs or anything like that. But and then the Queen thanked us in that memorable uh, broadcast that she made. And that was like all quite nice. And that's when it should have just ended and we should have got back to normal again because we did our duty to God and to the Queen, as they say. We did our duty. But then they just kept pushing it. They kept pushing it. See how much they'll take. See how much they'll take. And it was like our national characteristic, the best of us, the best of our national characteristics was just getting abused, taken advantage of. That's certainly what it feels like to me and and to others as well, that we were just get we're now just getting it ripped out of us, quite frankly. 
you know. And it's strange that it should be happening because there are now a lot of articles and a lot of people in the press and media saying what should happen and just saying, let's wind all this down. Let's remove this, let's wind down the fear factor and let's gradually, we now know enough about it to get back to normal and to shield those that are particularly vulnerable. But no, they just keep pushing it, keep pushing it. It's, 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 one can understand people trying to like figure out crazy reasons for that because objectively it doesn't make any sense why they should keep pushing. Anyway, other other British cultural characteristics, which self-sacrifice, um, courage and adversity, keeping on, keeping on in the face of massive odds, the few prevailing over the many, things like that. We'll develop those ideas in time in an article, but those are British cultural characteristics and they can all be found. They can, they all have their basis in some kind of uh, cultural expression in the past. And, and um, that's, we need to find the, those strengths again, so to, to pull out of this situation and to hold our politicians, whoever they may be to account, because we're not going to be, um, partisan on this particular issue at all. David, good to see you. David's reading George Orwell's 1984 just now and some aspects of the book we are seeing today. In fact, yeah, that's right. Um, some people call it COVID-1984. I've noticed that going about the internet. Yeah, so not all cases of COVID are created equal. And this is the best article. We'll put up the link to that, although it's, it is behind a pay, paywall. It's in the Daily Telegraph last week. And it, it's the best article that we've seen on what is a case? What is a case? And it's really, really educational, really educational. And it points out that let's say you developed a viral cold last winter. Were you a case? on a theoretical level maybe, but on a practical real world level, the answer is no. You went to work and carried on with life. You were invisible to the authorities. Let's say it got a bit worse and you saw your GP. You're still not a case. You decided to take a couple of days off. Still not a case. You might show up in sick leave statistics, but not as a case of respiratory infection. If you got so far as being admitted to hospital with illness, then you would show up as a case. And that's a tiny proportion of those who actually had the illness. And this fellow, Dr. John Lee, professor of pathology continues. He says, the contrast with today is clear. COVID was made a notifiable disease in February, obliging all cases to be reported to the authorities. But since the only way to identify COVID, COVID is with a test, positive tests have been equated with positive cases. But a positive test is clearly not a positive case in the true meaning of the word. And yet we're still being frightened by the politicians on of all parties trying to scare us with the idea of positive tests equaling cases serious cases of infection. And he concludes, he goes, that we now know enough about what is going on. And he says, on, the, on that basis, the course we should be taking is clear. Asymptomatic spread is good. It's good. We should advise and help the very elderly and those with serious illnesses to shield if they wish but do not compel them because it's their life after all and let everyone else get completely back to normal. So we, we have to totally agree with, with that particular point of view. I'm just going to go on in a moment to speak about the, the uh, increase in the, uh, for separation in the polls. Now, but before I do that, I want 
just to bring your attention to a competition that we're running on our Facebook page at the moment. And it closes at 6 p.m. tonight. So there's still plenty of time for you to, to, to enter that. Now, what it is, is we're in partnership with a flag maker, a wooden flag maker, who makes beautiful wooden flags of all sizes, in all shapes and colors. And he has produced a beautiful Union Jack wooden uh, flag, which is ready to hang on your wall. It's 37 inches by 19 inches, and it's complete with wall hangings and everything. And he would normally sell it at 250 pounds, but it's given away free tonight to one lucky person. And all that lucky person has to do is to go onto our Facebook page, find the post, is two or three posts down, share it to your site and officially like our page. Okay, so when at the top of the browser, you'll see a like or you can hover over our link and you'll see a like and you'll officially like and follow our page and do the same for his page, which we've linked to, which is called Dramatic uh, Scotland. And uh, please do that. Share his page and also officially like his page. And then this evening at six o'clock, he'll gather everybody who's done that and randomly choose somebody to send this 250 pound flag to free of charge. So please do enter that. Please do enter that. And we'll put the link up to that competition on our YouTube page here and also on our Facebook page. There it is, I see, when a 37 times 19 wooden union jack flag. Click on that, you'll get taken to our page, share it, share Dramatic Scotland's page and also like our page and like his page. And you could be in with a chance of getting a beautiful flag and just check out his page because it really is, it really is uh, a very, uh, a very good page and a great creative artist is is this man dramatic scotland creations is the name of his facebook page and that closes at six o'clock tonight sally has said i've entered the giveaway good 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 all the very best to you on that one quite a few people i know doing it who else who else dotty dotty's hopefully entered that as well good for you good for you okay folks <clears throat> we're going to go right over to youtube now and we're going to concentrate on youtube and the reason for that is we need to get our subscribers up on youtube and we need to get our viewing hours up and once we've got our subscribers and viewing hours up, then lots of opportunities will open up to us via the, the YouTube platform, including outside broadcasting with mobile phones and, and um, merchandise opportunities as well. We'll be able to sell our T-shirts and all that kind of stuff on YouTube if we get up to a thousand subscribers. So that's our immediate goal, which we really need to get done by the end of this year. So that's why we're really concentrating now on getting people over onto YouTube. So please, we're going to come off. We're going to come off YouTube, but we're going to be talking about the indie support hitting a record level, which is not good. And we'll also be talking about latest communication that we've got from Twitter regarding the situation of our platform, which was the biggest platform, the biggest pro-UK unionist platform on Twitter until they unjustly and wrongly and appallingly took us off, took us off on absolutely spurious grounds. And we've got more evidence now that the grounds were absolutely spurious. And so we need your help to think, what can we do about this? So we're just going over now directly onto, onto YouTube. See us there. Put the link up. We'll make sure you've got the link that you can click on um, for, for YouTube. And um, Please put that at the top of our page. 
so that you just click on that and you'll get taken straight through to the YouTube broadcast. See you there, folks. Okay. Okay, folks, we are here on YouTube and hopefully welcoming in a few people from Facebook also. Tony says, hi, Alistair, keep up the good work. Rule Britannia from Shorts. Christopher says, you're so right about the snitch culture that has arisen as a result of all of this COVID stuff. It reminds me of East Germany, to be honest, with people reporting others. Exactly. It's not it's not British, is it? It's not British. And it's 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 upsetting. OK, so this week we had the uh, unfortunate news that support for Scottish independence has apparently, according to the polls, reached 58 percent its highest level yet well as we always say polls are used to lead opinion as much as to reflect opinion and it's very easy just to get any kind of answer you want on an opinion poll so we only give them limited limited uh, credence we only give them limited uh, attention but we do we do notice them and we, we are concerned when things like this happen. So what to make of it? Well, as we said at the start of this COVID carry on pantomime, when you put the first minister on television every single day, she is eventually going to, 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 to evolve into a, a mother character for the nation, like mother nation, you know, that's, that's going to happen. And the best that we can do is to be conscious of that and fight against it in our subconscious so that we don't get taken in with that. But when you put somebody up there every single day, broadcasting on every single medium and not being properly taken to task by the journalists, then people will just focus in on her and she's providing she doesn't make a major misstep, she's not going to lose any support and she might gain support. So these things are only, this sort of stuff is only natural when you elevate a leader into such a prominent position in the national life and especially on the national media. So these things, so in a sense, it's natural, not because she's talking sense, but it's just the way that the mind starts to change when that's all you are um subjected to when that's all that you see it just becomes like second nature you know almost why is nicola Sturgeon not on the telly I, you know i thought she would be on switch it on there she is thank goodness nicola Sturgeon again thought she had gone for a moment you know that's that's almost like the way that it seems so we need to be concerned about this. Of course, we need to be very concerned about it. And the Scottish election, if it's still going ahead, if Mother Sturgeon doesn't decide to postpone it for a year, just so that she can keep sticking on the telly and can, can stay in front of us for another year, if she doesn't decide to postpone it, it should be going ahead on Thursday, the 6th of May, twenty. 21. Now, the narrative, the story that has been built up by the mainstream media is that if her party, along with the Scottish Cabbage Party, which is to say the Soggy Greens, if they were to get a majority of seats with perhaps one or two other independence minded people on the regional list, if they were to get a majority of the 129 seats, then somehow that would be what they call a mandate for a second separation referendum. A mandate means the authority to do it. Well, if everybody accepts that, then that's what everybody's going to suddenly find themselves tied into. So we don't accept that. We do not accept that a mandate at a devolved assembly 
a majority of seats at a devolved assembly. We do not accept that a majority of seats at a devolved assembly is a mandate to break up the wider state, to break up the United Kingdom. We don't accept that. Now, we have laid out our position in an article which appeared this week on our website saying Holyrood cannot deliver Indiref 2 mandate. And we sum up why that is, and we sum up what a proper mandate would be. We say that only a vote in the Union Parliament, which is to say Westminster, only a vote for that Parliament can potentially deliver a mandate for a second referendum to be held to break up the United Kingdom. Because the United Kingdom is a precious inheritance. It's the great work of time. It cannot just be broken up easily. You have to find ways to make it very, very difficult to break it up. So we base our position upon the following four fundamentals. One, the United Kingdom is one big country. One big country is the United Kingdom that it's come together through time, through hundreds of years, since at least the Union of the Crowns in 1603, and especially since the Parliamentary Union of 1707, it has developed into one big country. Of course, it's got smaller countries which are part of it, but it is one big country. And as such, it is our home, and we do not want to see it broken up. And we will do whatever it takes to keep it together. So that's fundamental number one. The UK is one big country. Fundamental two, it is not for Scotland alone to decide to break up our one big country and effectively destroy it. It's not for Scotland alone to do that because those hundreds of years have created millions of people who are invested in keeping the United Kingdom as one big country. So it's not for Scotland alone to do it. That's why it cannot be done through a devolved assembly. It has to be done to find a mandate for a second referendum. It has to be done at the level of the union parliament, the parliament that represents all of these millions and millions of people. Fundamental number three, the union parliament has a mandate for unity right now. And so if you were looking for a mandate for separation, you have to find it at that union parliament. How does the mandate for unity work? We've said it before and we will keep saying it every single time we here in Scotland or Wales or England or Northern Ireland go to the polls and elect a candidate to sit in Westminster, regardless of what party, that candidate represents, then when that candidate is elected, they are giving a mandate to that parliament to govern on behalf of all the United Kingdom. And see, Sinn Féin understand that very well. That's why they don't send their people to Westminster. They attempt to disarm the moral authority of the parliament by not sending their candidates. But so long as we vote for candidates to sit there, and so long as those candidates sit there, then the 650 of them in there, give or take the Sinn Feiners, all of these people represent a mandate for the unity of the United Kingdom. They are what are keeping the United Kingdom together. So if you want to break that up, your mandate has to be found at that level. And the fourth fundamental is, of course, we understand the correct nature of devolution. It, uh, Holyrood, for all the pretensions of the Scottish National Party, is not an equal body to Westminster. It is an arm of Westminster. It was created by the Union Parliament, and it is in a vertical relationship with it, not a horizontal relationship with it. So you can only believe that a majority of seats won at Holyrood is a mandate to demand another vote to break up the United Kingdom if you believe the mistaken notions that 
the United Kingdom itself is not a nation, that the Union Parliament has no democratic legitimacy, nor does it have a duty and responsibility to all the other people of the U United Kingdom, which has been developed over hundreds of years. And you also would have to believe that Holyrood is somehow equal to the British Parliament from which it is derived. Well, all of those propositions are false. All of them are false. Yet we never hear the media pointing those things out. And to be frank with you, many of our members of parliament don't even know the correct constitutional realities, which we're just articulating to you right now. So if you want to seek a mandate to maintain the United Kingdom, you do that at the Union Parliament. And if you want to seek a mandate to break up the United Kingdom, you also have to find that at the Union Parliament. So what would be a sufficient mandate for the SNP to demand a second independence referendum? It would be this. It would be this. The SNP and any other group would have to do it at the level of the United Kingdom Parliament during a United Kingdom general election. In that general election, they would have to stand as openly avowed abstentionists. In that general election, they would have to win a majority of the UK parliamentary seats in Scotland. And fourthly, they would have to win a majority of the entire electorate of Scotland. And if they could do those four things, then we could accept that there was sufficient demand for a second independence referendum. But until, God forbid, such a thing were to happen, there should be no second independence referendum. And we need politicians who will stand up and tell this very, very straightforwardly to Nicola Sturgeon and the rest of them, and who will thereby help to change the frame to get us out of this particular uh, path that we have stepped badly upon. So that's that's the mandate for unity and the mandate for separation. And you can check that um, if you can put the link up there to that in the comments as well. That's the first article on our site, which is a forceforgood.uk. That was published this week. And please put this about because this has the power to change the frame entirely. And furthermore, this is correct constitutionally and and it's correct morally because people will say to us Alistair I live in England I don't want to see the United Kingdom broken up yeah this is how we can defend it and it's also correct in terms of popularity because if you look at the statistics which you'll see in the article turnout for Westminster general elections in Scotland is way higher than the turnout for Holyrood assembly elections, way higher. And so it makes sense that if you're trying to break up the United Kingdom, you should be doing it, attempting to do it at not the Scottish assembly level, but at the British Union Parliament level. In fact, the last if we look at the last five general election turnouts in Scotland, the average is 66% of the electorate. And if we look at the last five of the Holyrood turnout elections, the average turnout is a paltry 53%, barely over half the electorate. But the electorate is not really engaged at Holyrood elections, but it is certainly engaged at the British level. Just, just, just finally on that, uh, we noticed an article in The Spectator by Stephen Daisley this week it says unionists must stop playing by separatist rules. And he's he he's largely correct here in a lot of what he says. And we particularly like this bit. He goes. There are any number of union minded philanthropists putting their coin into ideas and policy. Well, uh, that's a new one to me. I didn't know there was any union-minded philanthropist putting any money into ideas and policy, but let's take his word for it. But so little of it ever gets out of London. Well, instead of investing in London's 79th centre-right think tank, 
how about investing in Glasgow's first pro-union think tank? Well, we liked that sentiment and we certainly were and are Glasgow's first pro-union think tank, although I don't think he's referring to us. I think he's trying to ignore us and, and uh, uh, hope for something else to come along. But if you are a union-minded philanthropist throwing uh, your coin into ideas and policy, then please do consider giving to a force for good because we are producing this kind of documentation that I've just been reading out to you that you won't find anywhere else. And you struggle to find even academics who understand what we've just said. You you certainly struggle to find politicians who uh, who understand the nature of the union relationship to the depths that we understand it. So we are the people that you need to be helping if you are what he what he's calling a union minded philanthropist. And for those of us who are just normal folk who would like to give maybe a pound or two a week, please do go to our union supporters page. And we'll put the link up there. And for as little as one pound fifteen a week, which works out at five pounds a month, you can support our work here. And at this moment, we've got 168 union supporters and we value every single one of them. But we need to get up to 250 and we need to be doing that by next year. So please do help us there uh, with a monthly donation if you can. And it can be just up to, as I say, £1.15 a week, which works out at a five or a month. Or if you prefer just to give us a one off, then we just go to a forceforgood.uk forward slash donate to numeral to donate to and we value everything that 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 you can possibly possibly give now twitter oh my goodness me as many of you know we were we were unjustly removed from twitter on the evening of Monday, the 17th of August, along with lots of small C conservative websites worldwide. And the that was a particular, a particular indignity because we had built up over the course of years thir over 30,500 followers. We were by far and away the biggest pro-UK unionist organization on Twitter, making several comments every day, helping to lead the union debate. With that platform taken away from us, obviously we have suffered as far as profile is concerned. One of the reasons is, this is one of the reasons why we're building up our YouTube channel. However, we hold out hope that we will be unsuspended and we made five appeals between the 17th of August and the 7th of October, when out of the blue, we got a message from Twitter to tell us, we're writing to let you know that you're account has been suspended and will remain suspended due to multiple or severe violations of our platform manipulation rules. Now, we went into what they were talking about on that in our broadcast on the 22nd of August, which we'll put up after the show again in the description. And we went into that. And of course, we are not manipulating the platform in any way, shape or form. We read the rules on that and it was hard enough to understand what they were talking about, let alone know how to do that. So we have never engaged in anything like that. And that was just an absolute piece of nonsense. But they go on as if to elaborate on it and they go, misleading others on Twitter by operating fake accounts is a violation of the Twitter rules. Fake account. In what possible way could they imagine that a Force for Goods Twitter account was a fake account? That account in the very header at the top of it had four photographs of me personally. An easily identifiable individual. So 
what this said to us is that they didn't even look at any of our appeals because in those five appeals that we made between being suspended and th receiving this strange message, we elaborated at great depth about who we are and uh, our addresses and how to contact us and our mobile phones and our company registration numbers and where our company was registered and everything like that to show that we are obviously a million percent genuine. And we also asked for evidence that we had done anything that they were accusing us of. And of course, answer, there came none. So what, again, you've got here is simply Facebook throwing its weight around because it can. Now, when you think about that, that's really democratically dangerous because there are no other Twitter accounts on Twitter of our nature, that is, and of such reach, that is an actual campaigning organization for the union, reaching almost easily a million people a month. There are no others. There's lots of anonymous accounts that are unionist, and there's one or two smaller organizations with much more limited reach than what we've got, but we were by far and away the leader. And that's really all we spoke about. Um, we'd sometimes dip our oar into other small C conservative issues, but only within the context of, of our union and pro-British concerns. And we certainly never did anything like uh, violate any of the terms on certain speech codes, never did that at all. And as we always say, we didn't even swear, you know. So a, a, a complete injustice uh, that, we, that we will continue to to appeal against and we hold out hope that perhaps uh, somebody will actually read our appeal because clearly that's not been happening so far. It's not been happening so far. But Twitter are really going at it. Uh, I saw in the, in the Metro this week, 15th of October, Twitter suspends fake accounts of black supporters and it suspended a number of accounts by black supporters of US President Donald Trump. The social media company said the accounts broke its rules on spam and platform manipulation, exactly what they claimed that we were doing. Many of the accounts used images of people that did not match their names. Well, whether they went into that in such depth, I don't know. It did not specify how many accounts it had suspended. So it's clearly going all out to take off anything that might be vaguely pro-Trump. And we may have got caught up in that because a lot of American accounts got taken down and they maybe thought that uh, A Force for Good was some kind of pro-UK, pro-Trump account. I don't know what they thought about that, but maybe they just thought I was conservative minded. It must be for Trump will take it off because it's got a very big reach. That may be all that has, ha as has happened. So... Lo and behold, not only did we get that message, but you see, this is the thing with the force for good, is that if you do something to us, we will remember it and we will find ways of making our point known. That's always been what we've done. OK, so here is a book which has been produced. It came out on the 15th of October. I pre-ordered it. I got it on the 15th of October from Amazon. It's called Deleted, Big Tech's Battle to Erase the Trump Movement and Steal the Election. And it looks at the power of social media companies to censor small c conservative voices. And it's written by a chap called Alam Bokhari, who is a senior technology correspondent at Breitbart News. Now, Breitbart News is a conservative news outlet in America. They've also got a British arm as well. And so it, I, I got it two days ago, and I've already read about a quarter of it, and it's really well written, and it is an eye-opener. And so I'm giving this a punt. You can get it off, if you're interested in this sort of thing, get it off Amazon or anywhere else. Breitbart News will be selling it as well. Deleted, it's called by Alam Bokhari. And really good. And I'm reading this in order that to hope that it will give me ideas that I can formulate policies that can be used, that can be taken to our politicians 
and we can hold these companies to account for what they are doing to us. And when you think about it, that should be easy enough to do because whether you, all of these companies have to have to respond to the rules of the country that they live in, whether that's Scotland or, or the United Kingdom. So if we can get policies through Parliament, and Boris Johnson really should be doing this, which will hold these social media companies to account for their political censorship, then we can make life a lot harder for them. And um, that might mean that they're going to have to employ more people, for example, to, to pro deal properly with the appeals process. It may mean that they're going to have to have a much fairer appeals process. Uh, it, but things like that need to be brought in just to make it just so that it's an onerous thing for them to get rid of absolutely good accounts. You know, I've nothing against Twitter getting rid of accounts that are uh, spammy, that have got very low followers, that are completely anonymous, that are that are uh, nasty um, or, or bad in, in certain ways. They sh they sh they sh they've got a perfect right to do that, but they can't turn around to a professional organization like a force for good and just delete our, our our Twitter account as if as if we're nobody. They can't do that. Well, they can do it, but they're not going to get away with it. And we will ensure that we come up with ways to make life a lot difficult for them. And here in the United Kingdom, we can do that, whether through Hollywood or whether through through Westminster. So Keep an eye out. Keep an eye out on that. Pete says free speech isn't free. It has to be fought and won for all the time. That's for sure. Well, folks, good. Good to see everybody on YouTube. Please hit that like button. That also helps our our um, reach. If you hit the like button. And please do subscribe as well. And Christmas is coming up. Remember to get your wee copy of the wee book. As it's only a fiver. And you can buy one or two copies. You've got some grandchildren. Send each of you your grandchildren a wee book. If you want me to sign it, I can sign it as well. Just leave a wee message in there. When you buy it, it's only a fiver. And we'll get that straight out to you this coming week. Also, of course, our flag badge, which is this flag behind me, it says a force for good through the middle of it. These are good for clicking into Christmas cards, for example, to send a wee gift to, to a friend. And we've got the other one as well, which is the Union Heart. Again, with a force for good through the center of it. They're very well priced and they're good sellers. And Christmas is coming up. So there you go. Good, good. Well, this week, this week in British history and exciting week in British history. Today, the 17th of October, was the day that George II addressed Westminster and asked for money to fight the Jacobites. And we found his speech that he gave it's on Google Books and we transcribed it in its entirety and we'll post that tonight. My lords and gentlemen, the open and unnatural rebellion which has broke out and is still continuing in Scotland has obliged me to call you together sooner than I intended. So wicked and daring an attempt in favour of a popish pretender to my crown headed by his eldest son, carried on by numbers of traitorous and desperate persons within the kingdom and encouraged by my enemies abroad requires the immediate advice and assistance of my parliament to suppress and distinguish it. And it goes on in that vein. And he must have been pretty successful in it because, of course, we know the consequences of that. That ended a few months later on the battlefield of Culloden. Also on this day, one of the founding heroines of British Canada died. Her name was Laura Secord, and she passed away on the 17th of October, 1868. 
And what had happened was she had overheard the Americans. This was the war of 1812 to 1815. She had heard the Americans were going to be attacking the British near Niagara Falls. And she ran overnight through the woods and forests and hills and mountains to tell the British what the American plans were. And she was aided in that by a, a contingent of Mohawk warriors with, with whom the British were allied against the Americans. And very shortly thereafter, the British were prepared and they beat the Americans in the Battle of Beaver Dams, along with their Kanawaki and Mohawk allies. We ambushed the Americans and took them prisoner. And she was born in Great Barrington in Massachusetts. And we hear a lot about Great Barrington these days because there's a Great Barrington declaration on how to do COVID properly, which we tend to be in sympathy with. And I actually lived just outside Great Barrington for about three months when uh, I, was, I was younger. So I know Great Barrington very well. And I had many a pleasant day in Great Barrington back in the 1980s late 1980s. On the 18th of October, 1541, I like this one. This is when an English woman of Welsh heritage became the Scottish queen and helped to unite the kingdoms. And I'm talking about Mary Tudor. And she passed away on the 18th of October in 1541. And she was a Stuart, uh, sorry, she was a Tudor. And she married into, uh, she married James the Fourth of Scotland, who was to die at Flodden Field. But when Elizabeth the First, who was also a Tudor, when she passed away without children, the line went through Margaret Tudor and arrived at the great James the Sixth of Great Britain, who created this wonderful flag. So she's the reason in why James the Sixth became the king that united the kingdoms of Scotland and England. And we always call him James the Sixth of Great Britain because historians call him James the First of England and James the Sixth of Scotland, but he wanted to be called James the Sixth of Great Britain. And it was on the 20th of October in 1604 that he made that proclamation. And he said, wherefore we have thought good to discontinue the divided names of England and Scotland out of our regal style and do intend and resolve to take and assume unto us in manner and form hereafter expressed the name and style of King of Great Britain. Fantastic. And we did a big article on the Union of the Crowns, which is on our website, and we'll put that up in the link at the moment. And we call him James the Sixth of Great Britain because that's how he wanted to be styled. But it also makes sense because he was the sixth James in the territory which had become the realm of Great Britain, even though England had never had a James the First before. Just as today, Elizabeth the Second is the second Elizabeth in the territory which has become the realm of the United Kingdom, even though. Scotland never had an Elizabeth I. So that's undoubtedly the correct style in James VI of Great Britain, and it avoids that tortuous VI of Scotland, I of England styling, which we don't, which we don't uh, approve of. On the 21st of October in 1805, the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, what can you say about that other than everything, quite frankly? And of course, that was when Nelson, unfortunately, was killed. And he's been in the news lately because as one of Britain's great heroes, there's a certain element of academia and political reality who want to bring him down. And one of the things that they say about him was that he supported slavery. Well, he almost certainly did not. But even if he did, really, at the end of the day, so what? You know, but he almost certainly did not. Yet they really push that 
against him. And they really hold that against him on the basis of a letter that he wrote, which this week has been shown by the Daily Mail to, in fact, be a forgery. Does this doctored letter sink claims that Nelson backed slavery? We'll put up the link to this in the in the link there. Fascinating, fascinating. One of the things it seemed that he was concerned about was the extent to which there would be um, massacre and anarchy in some of the Caribbean states where it to be abolished overnight, which of course is correct. That's exactly what there would have been because that's exactly what was going on at the time. All sorts of fighting there between the British interests and the French interests and, and all the slaves who were caught in between it all. So uh, a massive political issue at the time, but it seems that he never wrote the words that have been, that he's been accused of, of saying. And the, it concludes here that the, the, the author, who, who's a Nelson scholar, says that Nelson even lent his support to a scheme, blah, 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 blah. As the National Maritime Museum seeks to address issues raised by the BLM movement, it is to be hoped that it recognizes that history, like politics, is a dirty game and that the truth is not always what it seems, nor is it necessarily written by the winners. That's a good point because the losers can write their history as well. Very often, sometimes that's all they write and they, they tend to elaborate upon it as well. So we'll put up a lot of information this week. We, we gave a speech about Nelson's relationship with Scotland in 2018 and maybe this week is a time when we should actually publish that that's what i think i think we'll publish that this week on our website a force for good dot uk and the, one of the one of the things there was john doig was the youngest scots lad at trafalgar a 10 year old on hms victory 10 year old powder monkey as they called them. And John Doig was from Leith. And on the 23rd of October, the British Parliament sat for the first time on the 23rd of October, 1707. It sat as a consequence of Article 3 in the Treaty of Union, which states, that the United Kingdom of Great Britain be represented by one and the same parliament to be styled the Parliament of Great Britain. So that sat for the first time on the 23rd of October, 1707. And the world was never the same since. Folks, thank you very much for watching on YouTube. Thank you for all those who came over from Facebook. Please hit that uh, like button, please do subscribe to us. You need to, when you click subscribe, if you don't have an account, it will ask you to get a Google account. So you do it that way. And then uh, you'll be able to comment, you'll be able to like, and we'll be able to speak with you on the chat there. So please do keep in touch with that and send us your email. Uh, click that link that says a force for good.uk forward slash support put in your name and email, and that ensures that we'll be able to contact you regardless of what Twitter might try to do to us or whatever the opponents of the truth may wish to do with us. We're going to be back next week. We'll be back at the usual time, which will be 1 p.m., God willing, and we will we'll see you then. Christopher says, thank you for another great and informative broadcast. Christopher, it means a lot to us that you are watching and thank you for for your support thank you for your support and thank you to all those who do support a force for good ladies and gentlemen it just remains for me to say god bless the united kingdom and god save the queen